Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Indies Trusted Servant Show on InspireSmall.biz. Um, what is the Indies Trusted Servant Show? Well, first of all, let me tell you who Indies Trusted Servant is. That's me, Danny O'Malley. I do customer service training and keynote speaking about customer service. It's all about the organization, the culture of the organization. I learned all of that from the hand of the master, my late father, Joe O'Malley, uh, in the O'Malley food market days. But even before that, when I was nine years old in the mid-50s and Joe O'Malley lost a little store in Broad Ripple, and then 10 years later came back and started O'Malley Food Markets very successfully. I learned, among other things, never, ever, ever give up. Uh, if you're interested in my customer service training or keynote speaking, give me a call at 317-413-9062. Now, what's the Indies Trusted Servant Show on InspireSmall.biz? I like to describe it as lively local small biz and community talk where you can feel the pulse of Indy. And today we're going to go into the community talk part of all of that with Paul Ainsley, the CEO of a great organization uh, called the St. Vincent de Paul Society. And um, as a member of the Catholic community, I'm particularly interested to hear what Paul has to say. So welcome to the show, Paul. Thanks so much, Danny. I'm very happy to be here. Happy well, to speak with you. It's great to have you. Um, Paul spoke at Catholic Business Exchange a couple of months ago, and I thought to myself, I better get Paul on the show. So here we go. I always have my guests tell uh, our, our viewers a little bit about their background. So far away, where are you from? Sure, sure. Where'd you go to school? What'd you study? And what'd you do before St. Vincent de Paul? Sure, well, that's a long story. Uh, <laughs> so, so I grew up on a farm in central Michigan. Okay. Uh, I've got seven siblings, a nice big Catholic farm family. Uh, went to Catholic grade school, and public high school up there, up by Lansing. Uh, and went on to University of Michigan for, okay. for uh, undergraduate degree in engineering. Then I went on to grad school at Carnegie Mellon, got a master's and a doctorate. Uh, in engineering. In engineering. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's so. a fine school, Carnegie Mellon. Not that Michigan's not a fine school. I'm <laughs> lucky to have gone to those schools. They're there very, you go. Very excellent schools. So, and after that, I had a couple of, of small jobs in engineering areas. Then we went to work in the auto industry, uh, principally for General Motors, and I spent 30 years in automotive electronics. Oh, okay. Uh, Here in Indy? Well, in Detroit, in Indy, or actually Kokomo, and then in uh, Malibu, California for four years. Really? Well, when did you get to Indy? Uh, I got to Indy in uh, 1988. Was with, that with General Motors? With General Motors, okay, yeah. Okay. With General Motors, came down here and and stayed until 2003. Moved out to Malibu for an assignment. Okay. And came back in 2007. Still with GM. Still, still with well, okay. GM Delphi, the the family gotcha. of automotive electronics. There uh, is that all spin off, spun off and things like that. So then came back. I retired out of there in 2012. Went to work at Purdue. For five years doing STEM education oh. for, for uh, uh, elementary, K through eight awesome. programs. The STEM education thing is just an amazing, uh, you know, semi-new part of our education system. Right, and, it, and it, it does catch on well. The kids really enjoy a well-organized program like we were offering. So, so t tell the viewers what STEM stands so, for. So STEM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. Uh, it's those core subject areas that really chart the present and the future for what we can do, even things like this broadcast. Yes. Uh, possible yes. through STEM education where people learn how to do computer software and computer technology and the mathematics necessary for intergalactic communications even. And uh, produce a good place to have a that. Grace, have a good place to, to house that and it was a, a wonderful five years. And Outstanding. After I left that, I started just volunteering. So you, you <laughs> retired in what year? The 2018. 2018. What drew you to St. Vincent de Paul? Were you already a volunteer? I was already a volunteer. Yeah, I started yeah. volunteering locally here at the Boulevard Place uh, when we moved back in 2008 or so. Um, and uh, then I started, when I retired, I started doing home deliveries because that's a good thing for retirees to do. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. delivering, and then I realized I needed more help getting ready for home deliveries. So I started going in at 6 a.m. on a Wednesday morning to pack bags. Uh, and that and the interaction with the local conference at our at Macleod Heart Parish, where I belong. Uh, got me the opportunity to be considered to be president. And you became president when? In 2020. Uh, and I'm actually in my third year now. Okay, great. Uh, uh, so now, tell the, view the viewers what St. Vincent de Paul is, what you all do. Sure. So, so at its core, St. Vincent de Paul is a Catholic lay organization. Uh, we are separate from the Catholic Church. Separate structure. We're based in St. Louis, Missouri, here in the U.S. We're based in Paris, France, in uh, internationally. Uh, but we, we sort of work arm-in-arm arm a little bit with places like Catholic Charities. 
our three main focuses, focus, foci are first to work on the spiritual growth of all of our members. That's our number one goal, even though a lot of people may not know that. But the spiritual growth that we get through friendship, the second leg we have, and third is service for others. So spiritual growth through friendship and service to others is our basic mission. And the service to other really leads to the other two, basically. So what is yeah. the service to others? So for those of you who don't know. So, so if the first tenet to talk about is that within the society, we say that no act of charity is foreign to the society. If somebody needs help, we have to find a way to help them. Here in Indianapolis, that means our food pantry. We have a food pantry, big one over on 30th Street. That's probably the largest food pantry in the Midwest. Basically 30th and Keystone, so 30th right? and Keystone, about three blocks farther east. Yep. And we have the, same, the Boulevard Place Pantry over here, um, just a couple blocks from here, Boulevard and 42nd. Were you aware of this, Ryan? Okay, you were. Yeah, okay. So he, knew, he asked me about it. So, okay. so we have that. And then we have uh, other food pantries around central southern Indiana. Our particular archdiocese, uh, council serves central and southern Indiana, so kind of everything south of 96th Street, all the way down to the river, except for Evansville. Except for Evansville. Okay. Evansville is a separate diocese, so that little carve out down there, the four or five counties that they cover down there. So it's a big area, about 38 counties. And so we have stores in Shelbyville and, and uh, Bloomington. We have a warehouse. We have a food pantry in, in uh, uh, Brown County area. Okay. We have other food pantries down in in uh, Felsburg and those areas down I the had south. For, so. I've forgotten about your reach south of here. Oh uh, yeah, we go all yeah. the way down to the river and and although most of our emphasis really is here's Indianapolis area because it's it's the big the big issue in in the whole state really. Uh, we do care a lot about Richmond and Terre Haute and Bloomington and Columbus, Columbus yeah. and lots of areas like that too. Yeah. So we do, and my job is to really make sure that all of that's as inclusive as possible. So at, at 30th and Keystone, what happens? So at 30th and Keystone, we have a very large shopping area where people come and shop. Uh, we're open 18 hours a week. Uh, and in the background, we're receiving goods, either bulk goods, huge loads of whatever, cereals and, and produce and meat. From where? From. So most of our supplies come from either Gleaners. We're a pantry partner with Gleaners. So we get a lot of it shipped through there. We also work with Midwest Food Bank down on the south side. Uh, we work with, uh, in exchange with a, a, another Feeding America Food Bank up in um, Fort Wayne. Okay. So we get some things from them also. And then we get receive materials from, at times from Walmart, leftover goods we have from uh, Kaido. Uh, and from uh, Second Helpings. Okay. So a variety okay. of sources like that. Kroger is a huge supplier of leftover bread for us. So most of our bread comes through Kroger. So lots of partners in the a community. A lot of partners. You'll yeah. be glad to hear this. This morning I was getting dressed, ready to, for my nine o'clock meeting. Mm -hmm. I had uh, channel, uh, fo the local Fox channel mm -hmm. on. I like to watch the local news in the morning. And a, a, somebody from Gleaners was on there, and he mentioned you guys as a partner. Good. So these that. these these various organizations, you get, you guys are all really good at working together. We, we are very good, at, and, it, and it's very important that we work together, particularly during the pandemic, being able to make sure that you know we all knew what the other pantries were doing, and there's about 132 pantries in the county here. In the county. In the county. Wow. So and some of those are just small, open one day a month, and some of them are like us or like Gleaners that are open multiple multiple days a week. Uh, either way, we're trying to serve all the needs in the community, and the needs are huge. So if somebody is watching this and knows somebody that's short on food, mm -hmm. how do they access the, the food pantry at 30th and Keystone? So, okay, so our goal is that nobody is short on food. So they should come down to our pantry. We're open Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, Friday and Saturday mornings, and Thursday evening. And from so, what are the hours? So Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, we're open 8 a.m. till noon. So you can just walk in. Just walk in. You have to kind of, you don't really need an ID, but you need a proof of address. You can register to shop. We serve the entire county area and a little bit beyond if we have to, because there's hungry people just over the border. And so all they have to really do is bring in proof of address, okay, who they are, and we'll register them and they can shop once every calendar week. Once a week. Once, okay. once, once every calendar week. And they can take out what has been estimated around 100 to $140 worth of food. So can they take, they can't take all of the bread. No, no, can no. Can they no, just no. take one loaf of bread? One or two, depends on how much one we or, have. Okay. 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 And one or two meats depends on how much we have. They can have, you know, carrots and potatoes and, you know, a whole bag of potatoes, a whole bag of onions. Right. Right. Uh, 
we've had a lot of pineapples lately for some reason. So we just have lots of things like that. They can come and shop all that. Uh, yeah, you only get one can of the canned potatoes and one can of this or that. But one of this and one of them, one of that, you pretty soon have a pretty full shopping cart. You, you, you can probably eat for a week. You can eat for a week. Right? Or, or even if it, if it doesn't feed you for a week, it offsets a lot of the costs otherwise because sure. food, food is really expensive now. Sure. And so that becomes an area where we can really help offset some of that cost. Now, before we jump and talk a little more globally and about your uh, warehouse downtown where you've got furniture mm -hmm. and refrigerators and stuff yeah. like that, um, let's talk about the need for volunteers sure. right. and, and how somebody might look into that if, if they're retired and they're looking well, for something to do. Well, happy to have retirees. Always love retirees. We take virtually any volunteer down to about, about, about eight, 10 years old. So as long <laughs> as they have a parent, uh, but we're happy to have volunteers. Uh, we are open really six days a week at both facilities uh, because we have a work going on six days a week. So uh, at the food pantry or at the warehouse, uh, volunteers can simply go online to our website, svdpindy.org. VDP SVDPindy.org. SVDP SVDPindy.org. S okay. S St. Vincent de Paul. St. Vincent de Paul Indy. So SVDPindy.org. And under I Want to Help, you can donate time and you can sign up for a time block. Frankly, if you just walk through the door, we'd be happy to see you. Well, you mentioned you started delivering groceries. What, what other kind of jobs are there? So uh, in the food pantry, we have lots of jobs that involve sorting the goods we receive. If we get a food drive, say from Roncalli, and they're really great food drives they have, uh, we may get four or five really big bins of food, which are just miscellaneous items. And you got to be sorted out. So have to be yeah. sorted out. Okay. So we have to get that sorted out. Otherwise, we have large boxes of goods that we get from one source, like gleaners or wherever, and they have to be opened and broken down so that individuals can say get a box of cereal or a box of cookies or whatever else is in there. Or we get huge 50-pound bags of potatoes that have to be broken down into ah. individual bags. Or even bigger bags of carrots that need to be broken down. So there's You'll, a lot of handling like that. that ironically, when my dad owned that little store in uh, Broad Ripple. Mm -hmm. It had one cash register. Uh, that's how small it was. My first job was breaking down 50 pound bags of potatoes and putting them in five and 10 pound plastic bags with yeah. tie, twist ties, yep. and, and nine years old. <laughs> and, and we do a lot of that and we'd be happy to have nine year olds do stuff. So, so that's, certainly, that's a yeah. job a nine year old can do. Certainly that's true. So, so those sorts of jobs in the pantry are really getting all the food ready for shoppers because it's a client choice pantry. They get to go and pick out what they want. Now you've got people, um, kind of standing on the line and watching, right? Helping, I, yeah, help, I, I, I help this night, Thursday night. I always work Thursday night shift. Uh, and it's making sure that there are enough goods on the line. Okay, it's run over a lot of potatoes. Let's go find more potatoes to put on there. Are we out of potatoes? Well, what's next? So it's really making sure there's always goods available for them to take with them when they go uh, until we run out. Okay, so that's the food pantry itself. Right. Now you've got the warehouse downtown and tell us about that. So the warehouse operation, and we call it a distribution center because our goal is to distribute furniture and clothes, not to warehouse them, but to distribute. So it's a distribution yep. center. Distribution center. So we, so we have goods donated to us, clothing and furniture and appliances. Uh, we get some leftover materials through FedEx from a number of other companies that are getting rid of, say, returns, those sorts okay. of things. We get a lot of materials like that that come into, particularly uh, cleaning products. So all those things come into the warehouse and then are sorted into either goes into one of our stores, we'll talk about stores in a minute, or, or it becomes available for people who need uh, things in their home. Let's say somebody uh, living in uh, Carmel or Fishers or someplace or anywhere, really, mm -hmm. buys a new refrigerator and doesn't know what to do with their old one. You would like to have that old one. We would like to have the old one for sure. How do, how do they do that? So on, online at our website, again, is underneath I Want to Help is the Donate Goods. Same website. Same website. I want to donate goods and you can call a number and schedule a pickup. Awesome. And, and, awesome. and, we, and we, won't, we, we don't want to come by and pick up a box of clothes. Please bring that down to our warehouse to drop it off. Okay, you got, you're talking furniture. You've got furniture, furniture, appliances, yeah. those sorts of things. We're happy to do that. Uh, we take whole estates. We're happy to have whole housefuls of things, uh, furniture. Does, and, does that happen very often? It does happen occasionally, and we're always very grateful when it happens. So that's, that's a good way to get a, a large quantity of very nice things often. Now, what are the hours of the distribution center? Distribution center is pretty much open 10 o'clock until 3 o'clock or so. Uh, most days for drop-offs. Deliveries to individuals are by appointment. And to get to the point of getting a delivery from the warehouse, if you want furniture, if you want appliances, even if you want some clothing and, and household goods, uh, we first want to do a home visit. Ah, okay. So, okay. And, and back to the core of what we do, 
we're a one-to-one -one service organization. We want to come to your home in a pair. Well, a pair of us will come to your home. We'd like to visit with you, talk with you, talk about your needs. And then that generates what we call a referral form. Referral form says they need a dining room table. The kids are sleeping on four floors, so get them a bed or two, okay? They need a refrigerator, they need an electric stove or something like that. We'll get a referral form that comes back in. That then generates a process that flows all the way down to getting a phone call to them that says, please come on Tuesday. Can you come Tuesday at one o'clock? And we'll have all your goods ready for you. Please come and pick them up. So let's say somebody has qualified for a refrigerator, mm -hmm. but they don't have a vehicle they can pick up. Can you deliver it? We tend not to do that. Okay. Uh, there are drivers available that can do that. We sort of ask people. I'm, I'm trying to solve that problem right currently because so many, 25% or so of the people who come can't pick up everything that we have for them. I'm guessing that's yeah. the case. Or, you know, they had a truck lined up and that fell through. So suddenly, suddenly they, they're, they need their goods and we're trying to find ways to get them the big stuff. So little stuff's easy. We do beds in a box now. So that just, you throw that in the back seat. That fits just fine. Beds in a box? Beds in a box. Uh, a, <laughs> a, a company out of, out of Ohio called Maloof gives you a rolled up mattress and a full up frame. Son uh, of a gun. And so we offer, in brand new materials. And so we offer that now to, to really address a, a huge problem of kids sleeping on floors. Um, and so some of that stuff is easy to move. Refrigerators, stoves. Yeah, that's tough. Become, becomes a problem. Um, the other side of that is we don't always have a refrigerator for somebody. Right. So right. they can get on a waiting list. So we're always happy to have donations. We're always happy to have uh, access to gently used appliances and furniture. Uh, and most of it doesn't stay long. Uh, awesome. So, so how many employees do you have between the two places? So, uh, well, across the whole Indianapolis operations, we have about 53 full-time and part-time employees. That's a, that's a big number. And, and in 2016, the number was zero. So it's been a big change. My predecessor, John Ryan, uh, came in and said, in order to have... Uh, a reliable and accountable process. Yep. We need to have people who are here 40 hours a week. Yep. And yep. That, that they know that on Thursday they're going to do something and on Monday they, they're responsible for what they did. Are, are you able to fill those slots or, or do you need more help? We, oh, we always have more employees. We, we, always looking right now, we, we have a particular need for somebody who will, uh, who will run a new uh, center for uh, the unsheltered people. That we, need, we need a real solid case, master social works kind of case leader to run that operation. We've advertised that for a while. Been hard to fill that position so far, but we're still looking very hard for that position. If somebody knows somebody, how do they go about? On our website, we have a careers tab. There you go. You can you just go. go to careers and apply that way. Be happy to have them that way. So, so we generally have some very, we have excellent employees, very well skilled, very experienced. Uh, we're lucky to have the ones we have. Our, our managing, uh, our executive director, Peter Zubler, uh, Lynn Trombley, our CFO, uh, Wendy Harlow, who's our head of philanthropy, are all very skilled in what they do, brought a lot of experience to bear, and they have really made a huge difference in the way the organization runs operationally, whether it's, it's donations coming in from the outside or the how we spend the money and resources inside. So how many folks do you serve in, in, a, in a week, in a year, however you want to break that yeah, down? The, the food pantry right now uh, is serving, including home deliveries, about 3,400 families a week. 3,400 families, and you are one of many food pantries. So I want to emphasize that, the need. The need, yeah. Right? We are one, and and, and, and Gleaners is, is now making a shift back to drive through because they couldn't manage the volume coming through their door for inside shopping. So they're going back to drive through so people don't have to wait so long. We have a bigger space available, so we can get shoppers through pretty quickly. Um, probably the wait times are not much more than an hour from the time they arrive till the time they're leaving. Uh, not much longer than going to the grocery store. Not some, some days, yeah, that's true. Yeah. It, it, and we've worked hard to get that wait time and get the cycle time down so that people aren't burdened by coming to shop. We want to make sure that they feel what not only are they, as, is there, are they treated with dignity and they get to choose what they want. And that's very important. So they get to have that, that treatment of dignity from everybody. And they're not spending a lot of extra time in their lives trying to do this because they have lots of other things that they have to take care of. Certainly, lives. certainly. Yeah. So. 3,400 families at the food pantry. Right. How about the distribution center? Distribution center is working more, probably in the order of about 100 families a week, because it's, it's a much it's a much bigger operation in terms of trying to line them up and get them in there. But it would be 5,200 families. Yeah, rough. Really? Yeah. Yeah, that's, okay. Is there any crossover there? Do you have people go both places? We, we, we're sure they, they do, but our current data system doesn't can't, support that. Can't measure so that. So we're in the process of implementing a much more 
uh, integrated database system. So if somebody's in the food pantry, we know they're there. If they go over to the distribution center, they get a home visit, we know that. If they pick up goods, we know that. If they're in, say, our Changing Lives class, which is our Bridges Out of Poverty class, we'll know that too. So trying to integrate a better view, because we, we really want to fully understand the needs of the community. Not that you're hungry, but you're hungry and you needed furniture and you got burned out and all these other issues that become part of their lives. We want to be able to see that and address it all. You just mentioned a program you've got, right. yep. uh, an educational talk program. Talk about sure. that. So back in 2012, um, our at the time it was, a, it was our national president, who happens to be from Indianapolis at the time, Sheila Gilbert, was in the food pantry and saw people coming in week after week. And she says, "Why? Are, what are we doing to address the basic need that makes makes it necessary for them to be here every week? Come every week. And so she started looking into systemic change and recognizing that there are ways to, to help people who want to be helped to get out of poverty. And, and it's called, we call it Changing Lives Forever. It's a built on a program that came out of some work at Ohio State by Dr. Ruby Payne called Bridges Out of Poverty. And that's a way to understand social class structures, to understand the differences in wants and needs and desires of different classes, and then how to, for, for people in poverty to build a new life story on what it would take to step their way out of that. So we have an 18 class program that meets regularly, uh, 10 people-ish, maybe up no more than 15 probably, who are willingly in the class. We pay a small stipend for them to cover things like transportation costs or babysitting, whatever. Oh, nice, nice. Okay, and they have a meal served. Uh, my wife and I fix meals to take over there uh, for the local class. Just God, because, I love you. Just because sitting and eating is a really good community growth. Yes, activity. yes. So we build around that. We build around a very, very well-developed set of, of training materials. Uh, and we have facilitators, two or three facilitators, plus the people in the class. And it's really working together to understand not only what their stories are, but how their stories may be blocking them. Does, does some the, of this had to do with how to prepare to get a job and keep a job, that kind of stuff? Some of it has to do with, the, and, and not so much the the. the, the you know, job skills, but the interaction skills, the people skills you need to get a job, some things like that. Part of it also is how do you do a budget? What's it, what's it like to uh, have to pay rent and insurance and what's, well, how does that all work? So budgeting, uh, planning, uh, executing, those sorts of things become what they, what they want to do uh, when they're done. So they go through the class. Our, our particular class at Immaculate Heart graduates on Sunday night. Okay. They come to Immaculate Heart? Uh, actually, we do it over here at Martin Luther King Center. Because oh. it's closer to the bus routes and closer to where they live. Oh, so okay. So we're a big partner with Martin Luther King Center for doing that. Other classes meet similarly locally uh, around the city. Uh, we've had. Four, so they're not at the food pan pantry. No, no, no. We okay. do. Have, we have one at the distribution center because it actually that class is actually for people who are unsheltered, and so they know oh, where the food the pantry is because we have things. Almost, yeah. So they come over there and, and they have a program for them there. So so we work with almost anybody who's willing to do the work. Uh, to come into the class after 16 or 18 classes, depending on the structure, um, they graduate. Uh, they can have a mentor from Trusted Mentors. And you know Trusted Mentors. Oh, I've had them on the radio okay. show before. Great so, organization. So, so, so we'll get lined up with somebody from Trusted Mentors if they want it. Uh, one of our graduates from the first class at Immaculate Heart is still with his mentor four years later. Uh, and, and so there's really sometimes a close bond between these two. That's it's, a, and it's awesome how all these organizations are working, you know, they work together. Right. Yeah. Trusted Mentors is a great partner. So the program is there to give them a, a, really a leg up on getting out of poverty. Then we now have a graduate program that includes things like job skills. Uh, and so we've had 415 graduates from the first level program and we're about 70 graduates now in the, in the graduate program, um, helping to continue on that experience of, of not only working together as a group, but learning life skills to move up forward in their lives. That's just, that's fantastic. Uh, talk about the spiritual aspect of things before we run out of time. Here. Sure, yeah. So, so the key thing about spirituality um, among all of us is, first of all, we're not all Catholic. We don't have to be all Catholic. We'll have anybody. We have a, during the pandemic, we had a large contingent of young people from uh, the Mormons, Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints Church. You don't think of poor Mormons. No, 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 no. I'm sorry. Just these are volunteers. Oh, these are volunteers. These are volunteers. Okay, these are volunteers. okay, okay. Yeah. gotcha. Yeah, these are the volunteers. Excuse Great. Me. So, 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 again, whether they're volunteers or, or staff members, uh, our first goal in terms of spiritual growth is to say, let's make sure that everything we're doing is rooted in that Matthew 25, verse 40, okay? Whatever you do to the least of my brothers and sisters, you do to me, okay? Recognizing that that should be the basic tenet of our spirituality and then grow from there. 
recognize that there's a lot of good examples. St. Vincent de Paul is the patron of the organization because back in the 16th century, 15th century, 17th century, 1600s, he was really working very, very hard in Paris, in the regions around Paris, to help the poor, to help the starving, to help the war-ravaged people, uh, and really set up a structure of, of organizations, the Daughters of Charity, the Ladies of Charity. Is, uh, so all uh, that, those came from Oh, that came St. from St. Vincent, Vincent de Paul. Paul. Son and of then, a in, then in 1833, when in Paris, uh, Frederick Ozanam and others started to form the Society of St. Vincent de Paul then, uh, it was the same problems in Paris. I don't, you know, 200 years later, they were still dealing with the poor, the starving, the street bound, those who were coming uh, ravaged by uh, wars, continuing wars in Europe and things, and recognizing that the only way to help people is to go to their homes, find out what they need, take them what they need as best you can. And so you know, I was going to ask you about why St. Vincent de Paul. You just, you yeah. just answered that. Well, right? Yeah, he was, he was a great model and, and easily uh, fit, fit what they needed as, a, as a, really a patron saint for them. Um, not just St. Vincent de Paul. Uh, there's also uh, uh, St. Louis de Marillac, who was a nun at the time and helped with all those street work too. And this is back in Paris. Back, back in back Paris, then. back, back yeah. in the 1640s. Uh, really amazing people who were so dedicated to the work they were doing and also incredibly creative in finding the funding and the food and the space. St. Vincent de Paul got a gift of a, what amounted to a million dollars at the time from Louis XIII's estate. He was, no kidding. He was, he was connected to the to the house of Louis the Thirteenth in, in, in a religious way. Well, and a little history lesson there. So, so he, yeah. he he got a million dollars roughly, <laughs> and he used it to buy thirteen homes for the kids on the streets in Paris, and it became what's called the Thirteen Houses Project. We just bought a facility over on near Beach Grove on Churchman Avenue. It used to be the is still the Catholic Adoption Services. Oh yeah, we bought Saint, that uh, Saint Elizabeth Saint Elizabeth Coleman Center. Yes, we just yes. bought that. It has thirteen private suites where we're yep. going to be housing soon people unsheltered who want to change their lives. That is, and you so, know, I knew that something happened to St. Elizabeth's home, and I've known many young people mm -hmm. who took advantage of their services. Uh, I'm sad to hear that they're gone, or did they just move? They're, moving, they're moving up by the pyramids. They're, they're, they're moved, okay, yeah, they're moving. I got no, you. They, they're I'm glad to know they're, they're still around. They're busier than ever, actually. Uh, but uh, we're taking over the facility, and we'll use it to house and train and work with. Uh, the things we know now about Changing Lives programs, how to lift people out of poverty will give us a, a basis for helping their lives change for them. Do you have Do you have any trouble figuring out which thirteen of your clients fit? Well, um, <laughs> fit into those. We we see roughly two hundred and fifty clients or neighbors, as we like to call them, neighbors in need uh, every week through our homeless ministries. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we'll see them at our various sites. We have a big operation on Saturday down at, at Roberts Park Methodist Church, uh, and we so we see many of them. And you get to know them. We get to know get them, to know and, them. And, and we we have uh, our our key people in those areas do know. She, Linda, who does this, says, says, "I can get you thirteen people right now. Just just let me know when." Paul, I wish we had more time because what you're doing is fantastic. Give us that website again. Website again is svdpindy.org. You can sign up to help. You can donate goods. You can donate money, or you can just read about what we do. There's lots Absolutely. of good information about there, what we do. Well, God bless you Thanks for so. your mission. And next week on the Indies Trusted Servant Show, my guest will be Mr. Inspire Small Dot Biz himself, Ryan Henry. And we're going to talk about a big event that he's going to have. What's the date, Ryan? December 5th. December 5th. Uh, and he's going to kick off a whole new set of initiatives for Inspire Small Dot Biz. So don't miss that show next week. We'll see you then.